Earhart just retired from being our executive director of AMEC, which is the group that this church is part of. And so he just retired from that position. And we thought, oh, now that he's retired from that position, let's get him here to speak. So he's going to be teaching Sunday school. And I think you're coming back to preach as well. Later, yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, late, later on in the summer. Yeah. So anyway, so I'm excited to have uh, Bob here to share with us, and so let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll turn it over to Bob. Let's pray together. Our Father, our God, we are so thankful for the beautiful day that you have given to us. Lord, thanks for the beautiful sunshine, the warm temperatures. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to gather together this morning and to be taught your word by a gifted communicator. Lord, we pray that you would just fill Bob's heart and mind with the words that we need to hear. And Lord, make our hearts and minds open and receptive as your Holy Spirit works in us so that we can grow in our faith and that we can hold fast to the truth that is found in the word of God. So Father, thank you for this time together. Bless us as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Good to be with you this morning. What a beautiful Lord's Day. Uh, it's still not too hot. This afternoon will be a different story. We're going to be looking at a theme, a subject that it can seem to be quite complex. We're going to be looking at this for five weeks, starting today and going through the, the first Sunday of July. It won't be a, a study of Scripture as such, and in, in, as a Bible study. It will be a looking at the world in which we are expected to live as Christians in the light of God's word, using God's principles, using God's truth to guide our steps, to guide our conduct, to guide our decision making, to guide our evaluation. But one of the problems we have is that we often don't understand the world in which we're living. Now, most of you have been living for a while. Some of us have lived a little bit longer here on the planet than others. But what we grew up with is no longer in place in many parts of our world and of our culture. But I'm going to start by giving you an overview, my, my basic premise. It becomes, um, it's a metaphor that the Apostle Paul gives us in Scripture, and it's reinforced in many parts of Scripture. But it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'll just jump into the middle of, of the section where Paul says, For we are God's fellow workers, or we are co laborers with Christ, is the way many of us learned it in the King James. We are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds on that foundation. For no other or for one can lay no other foundation than the one that has already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, or wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work if what he has built... On this foundation survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. 
Now, we're not going to focus on that last part. Uh, is this talking about our personal salvation or is it talking about our Christian character that we build after we have become believers? Uh, and you may he hear different people emphasize different aspects of that. But I want to look at the first part. You are God's field. Uh, literally, uh, it can be translated, you are God's orchard. In other words, you are God's planting, not just for one season where you put in a crop of wheat and then you harvest it and the field's uh, fallow and, and the crop is done, but it's, it's a, a planting in which you expect fruitfulness year after year, an ongoing planting. But the other phrase is you are God's building. And a building has to have a foundation. And it's that foundation that cannot be changed, that has already been laid for, for the Christian faith, the Christian believer, the Christian church. It is Jesus Christ. What we want to look at is how is the building going on that foundation? And my thesis is that the foundation will not change. It will not fail. We don't have to worry about whether Jesus Christ will become too old to build our lives on, that he will have changed his mind about grace and salvation, that he will decide that, oh, you know, the cross, that really wasn't necessary. We're not, we're not concerned about the change of Christ Jesus. He is the eternal Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. He has died he has risen again. He is reigning at the right hand of the Father. He is interceding for us. He will come again and set all things straight, and we can debate as to how that's going to happen. And we, some of us have our theories and others disagree. But we don't have to worry about whether Jesus will fail. What we do have to be concerned about is what is built on Christ Jesus, the building of the church. The foundation will remain, but there are pressures that come against that church in every generation. The pressures might change from one generation to another, but every generation is experiencing attacks, criticisms, undermining, uh, pressures against what we believe as we base it on our foundation, Jesus Christ. And so in these five weeks, we want to look at, we will get to the point of looking at five major pressures that we're experiencing in today's world that are trying to move the church off of the foundation in one way or another. And uh, you'll have to come back each week to find out what all those five are. But... Our concept here is the biblical foundations of the church are under pressure. And what we are building can be shifted if we're not alert or anchored or faithful or hanging on, holding on, holding fast to that which is truly good, good in God's sight. Now, Frank and Ernest, um, Frank here is finding out that change is not inevitable. Well, we've been told that change is inevitable. Change always happens. Change keeps coming. And at this vending machine, unfortunately, it's not. But otherwise, we're not at a vending machine. We are experiencing change. You have experienced change. And just over a year ago, we had that interesting Saturday evening starting at Media and ending up at Waterway. And uh, some of you were there at the old church for the final time, and then we gathered and entered into this beautiful building um, on that Saturday night, and that's what it looked like. And if you were there, maybe you're in that picture somewhere. Um, and then COVID hit. The biblical foundations that are we're going to look at 
Um, and we won't have time to look at each of these sections uh, in, in detail. This morning we're going to look at one crucial question. There are two essential foundations. We'll touch on that if we have time. There are three sides to our spiritual heritage. Uh, there are four critical corners that have to be maintained to keep the structure intact and, and faithful to its foundation. But we're going to be getting then to the five subtle pressures that uh, are affecting your world, your lives, your family, your grandkids, uh, your kids, your life. Uh, five pressures that every time you watch a commercial, uh, every time you check your phone and, and scroll down through either news items or Facebook postings, you're bumping into some of these pressures. So, the biblical foundations. A number of years ago, and when some of us were younger, and some of you were teenagers, when I was a teenager, the... Uh, there were a couple books published. One is Know What You Believe, and another one was Know Why You Believe. Both were excellent, published by InterVarsity. Paul Little was the author. Those were very, very helpful because it was important to know what was the reason we were believing in Jesus Christ or believing that God's Word was, was true, believing that there was a God. And in those days... You could ask a person who claimed to be a Christian, why are you a Christian? What is the reason behind your faith? Why do you believe the Bible? What is the reason you believe in Jesus Christ? How did you come to believe that the Bible is true? Those were the questions that we were asking in Sunday school and youth group, uh, in summer camps, in our evangelism approach, uh, in our way of witnessing. Uh, these were the questions we were encouraged to think about, to have an answer in our own hearts and minds, and then to be able to approach another person. Now, most of us were too shy to use these questions uh, with our neighbors and our non-Christian friends in high school. And, but this was the approach, and it was a valid approach. It was a good approach. But it's not what most people are asking today. Today, it would be more, does Christianity work for you? How does it work out? What are you getting out of it? How does it benefit you? How does it make you feel? Uh, a non-Christian might say, um, you seem happy. I'm in trouble. Tell me how I can experience what you are experiencing. How can I find that happiness? They might not use the word joy, uh, but they want to get out of the predicament they're in, and they would like to have your experience as sort of their experience. Uh, the question that is being asked is, does it meet your need? Now, those are slightly different questions. There's nothing in this section. Um, sorry, Steve, I forgot to tell you when to advance, but I know you're keeping up. <laughs> okay. um, I'm used to having the automatic button here change the, the screen up there. But um, what, what's missing in these questions is words like a reason, the reason why. We've shifted from the facts that may be true about Christ to the feelings that we expect Christ to produce or your faith to produce or your belief to produce. And if you can get those feelings from any beliefs, from any ideas that are floating around out there, the reason we chose Christ might not really be that important to a person. As long as their needs are being met, it doesn't matter how or who or why. It just, once you feel good, you have it made. Once you have achieved happiness, um, 
fine. Across the uh, hallway from the AMEC office that we were renting in Bali is Pink Lotus office where you can come in and get in touch with your feelings through crystals and all kinds of other meditation and yoga techniques. And it's only one of four offices in the same building offering spiritual help without Christ, without a Bible, without reason, without having a way to think it through as to why it's true, but it's making people feel good. And they're paying for it and giving time to it. And this is in Pennsylvania Dutch heartland of Berks County. Okay, next slide. Let's look at an article, and this is, uh, you might say it's already out of date because it's from a few years ago uh, when the article was written uh, by this uh, particular professor. He was teaching at Princeton University. He has since moved on, actually. I'm not, I think he's now a professor emeritus somewhere. Um, but let's just look at this. And this has to do with the issue of abortion and pro-life. And those of you who have chosen to follow Christ and as Christians say that you have, you believe in the sanctity of life, that human life has value, that an infant should be uh, nurtured and, and brought to uh, birth and, and then trained and to grow up and to become a valuable uh, individual here on, on the face of the planet. Let's, uh, let's see what Dr. Peter Singer had to say about that. Teaching ethics, by the way, to I think some of the people who are now in politics were students at Princeton at that time. The ethical outlook that holds that human life to be sacrosanct I shall call it the sanctity of life view, is under attack. And he's right about that. He was one of those attacking it. The first major blow to the sanctity of life view was the spreading acceptance of abortion throughout the Western world. Supporters of the sanctity of life view have pointed out that some premature babies are less developed than some of the fetuses that are killed in late abortions. In other words, uh, there are babies who have been born prematurely, who survive, who are, uh, and there were fetuses that were far more advanced that were aborted uh, in, in terms of late-term abortions. They add, next slide, very plausibly, that the location of that fetus or infant inside or outside the womb cannot make a crucial difference to its moral status. The sanctity of life people think that morally the status of that child, that infant, that fetus, whether it's in the womb or out of the womb, uh, should have the same moral value, same moral status. Allowing abortions, especially these late abortions, therefore, does seem to breach our defense of the allegedly universal sanctity of innocent human life. A second blow to the sanctity of life view has been the revelation that it is standard practice in many major public hospitals to refrain from providing necessary life-saving treatment to certain patients. And this is where a baby is born uh, or even in a, maybe in the process of abortion survives and the hospital is allowing that child to die rather than to keep it alive. Now, when he wrote this article, this was a shock for people to realize, make, you realize that, are you sure that some hospitals actually do that? And then it became very public and, uh, and very legal in, uh, by law in some states. And so he continues, is the erosion of the sanctity of life view really so alarming? Should this really bother us that, that some lives are not being preserved? Change is often in itself alarming. Okay, get that. 
don't get upset about change. That, that's what you must expect. Change is, in, is inevitable, even though it's alarming, especially change in something that for centuries has been spoken of in such hushed tones that to question it is automatically to commit sacrilege. You don't want to talk about that preborn or, or that uh, unsuccessful abortion where a hospital is allowing the child to die uh, rather than keeping it alive. Or you don't want to really talk about the process of late-term abortions. Uh, that, that it's sacrilege because there's a moral value. Now he's describing the sanctity of life view. Continuing, whatever the future holds, it is likely to prove impossible to restore in full the sanctity of life view. Changes come. Don't expect to go back to the way it used to be or should have been. The philosophical foundations of this view have been knocked asunder. We can no longer base our ethics on the idea that human beings are a special form of creation made in the image of God, singled out from all other animals, and alone possessing an immortal soul. We can no longer base our ethics on those concepts. Our better understanding of our own nature has bridged the gulf that was once thought to lie between us and other species. That you are a human being. You are different than a gorilla. You are different than a hog or a heifer. You are different than your dog or your cat. Though many are calling their dogs and cats their grand pets and almost put more energy into them than their own grandchildren maybe. But our better, better understanding is that we moved beyond that That. Uh, that gulf. And uh, so why should we believe that the mere fact that being a member of the species Homo sapiens endows its life with some unique, almost infinite value? Once the religious mumbo-jumbo surrounding the term human, the idea that you're created in the image of God. That's religious mumbo jumbo that you have inherited. You think you are better than the other animals. You, we now know that you're simply an animal, maybe an advanced species, but what makes you think that you are so much better than other species? So once the religious mumbo-jumbo surrounding the term human has been stripped away, we may continue to see normal members of our species as possessing greater capacities of rationality, self-consciousness, communication, and so on than members of other species. You can talk better than your dog can. You can think through and uh, you can learn to read and you can learn to create in ways that other species, other animals just don't. But what about those human beings who can't? We have just a few blocks from uh, our church in Bali a home that is caring for very seriously disabled children. Children that cannot respond cannot talk, cannot walk, cannot control their, their, their bodily systems. They need to be cared for 24-7. This author is saying those children do not have moral values. They cannot communicate. They do not have capacities of rational, rationality. But the hogs that are being raised on a pig farm a few miles away are much more functional, functioning as they should as a species of hogs, of swine, 
than these human children that we're keeping alive who cannot function. Which one is more valuable? This author, Peter Singer, who taught at Princeton, says the animal has more value than this helpless child. We think it has value only because it's human. But we know that that human distinction because it's created in the image of God no longer applies. It's an animal, a human animal. Some of you turned out to be pretty functional. They didn't. Why are we wasting our time and effort taking care of them? It would have been better to abort them or to let them die now than to waste our resources on useless animal individuals. So we will not regard as sacrosanct the life of each and every member of our species, no matter how limited its capacity for intelligent or even conscious life may be. If we compare a severely defective human infant with a non-human animal, a dog or a pig, for example, this is what he's saying, we will often find the non-human to have superior capacities, both actual and potential for rationality, self-consciousness, communication, and anything else. You can tell your dog to do something to make it lie down. You can call it and it will obey you. That child cannot. Your dog has more infinite value than that child. Anything else uh, that can plausibly be considered morally significant, you can find in a healthy animal rather than a deformed human being. That's ethics. A few years ago, when he published that, it was shocking. Nobody's reading that article anymore because it's common. This is the way it is now. This has now been legalized in many parts of our world. There are those advocating that this should be legalized in our country, in all of its aspects. Some of it already is. Some of it is still being resisted by those who are still holding to a view that human beings are not on the same level as other animals because there is a creator, there is a God, there is an image of God in the human person and that human being has an immortal soul which is different than your pets and animals although some of you expect to see your cats and dogs in heaven there are horses in heaven Jesus rides a white one so uh, we're not sure about the rest only the fact that the defective infant is a member of the species homo sapiens leads it to be treated differently from the dog or pig Species membership alone, however, is not morally relevant. This is still Peter Singer's article. If we can put aside the absolute and erroneous notion of the sanctity of all human life, we may start to look at human life as it really is. Not in the image of God, but simply a product of evolution we've simply evolved a little bit further than some of the other animals. At the quality of life, each human being has or can achieve. We have to look at it, at, at it differently than we have been because now we know better. We know scientifically we're simply here by accident. Then it will be possible to approach these difficult questions of life and death with the ethical sensitivity, isn't that sweet, that each demands, rather than with the blindness of individual differences that is embodied, and he was criticizing our government policy at that point, uh, which this would have been, I think he wrote in 1984, so it would have been during the Reagan years. He, he's criticizing the Department of Health and Human Services, rigid instruction to disregard all handicaps when deciding whether to keep a child alive. And this was as a result of some of the hospitals that had been caught uh, leaving a child on the table to die without care because it was viewed as handicapped. Well, apart from the issue of pro-life versus pro-abortion, 
um, this is an example of how the reasoning that once defended a moral position, a moral value, has been changed to looking at other reasons, uh, functionality, uh, what, is, what is fair, what is uh, economically the best choice. Uh, but don't let the mumbo-jumble of your religious convictions get in the way. That has to be set aside. Okay, let's go to... Um, whoa. Okay, um, this is a poem that I, I found. It was written by a high school senior, I think, um, in our, published in our local paper some years back. Um, it, it, it's really... It's worth reading because I'm sure it will stir your soul. Hopeful to fulfill, though doubt will sunshine blues, decides for rain for an instant, wishing rain upon it all. Proves to me the God is here. She proves herself to me. As I cry, I feel it inside me, pushing out tears meant to be wept long before this time. I say bull. If she was writing it now, she probably would put the rest of the word in there. I say bull. After a night of planning peaceful, hopeful dreams, I realized what I am now, what I have, only a few. I say my hope. What the only thing to make me happy is, so I get it. This is to prove to me I may be saved, may not be saved. No one knows until then, until then she weeps. You feel blessed? Aren't you glad you came this morning to receive that gem? Now that's poetry in today's world. And she was asked, what do you mean? Um, which isn't really fair because you're supposed to conclude your own meanings. But basically she was writing that she had hoped for good weather for the next day for a picnic or for an outing with her friends and it didn't turn out and God she up there in heaven or wherever uh, didn't listen to her prayers and so she's really angry and upset and this whole idea of being a person who is saved by a God uh, I may be saved, I may not be saved who knows till then uh, but until then I'll just keep on crying that's the pathetic world of today's uh, culture, and I don't want to say today's generation as an age group. This is the culture that your church is now in, and you as Christians are functioning within this kind of culture. How can this be called such excellent poetry that it was chosen to be published? Because we're in a different world than the world some of us grew up in, or the world some of your parents or grandparents grew up in. You grew up in a world that was called modern. We are now living in a world that is being called post-modern, after the modern. That the modern failed us. We got to do something other than what we were doing, and we're moving beyond it, post-modern. Now, does, post-modern doesn't mean anti-modern. It doesn't mean everything that we did in the past we uh, eliminate, but it means that we change the way we handle it, the way we viewed it, and we're beyond that. We've moved on. The one thing that nobody in the postmodern world wants to do uh, that, that is a product of the modern world is the cell phone, the internet, the, the technology we have here, the air conditioning, the beauty, the, the comfort of your chairs compared to those hard pews. Uh, the, the, the technology of the modern world has made our postmodern world possible and comfortable and many times enjoyable and amazing. But that's only the technical side, the product of the modern thinking and the modern way of doing things. We're moving beyond that. And it will be interesting to see what the postmodern culture produces 
it, we know what it's enjoying, what it's trying to do and experience and feel, but what will it be producing, including another generation? Will it produce more children to replace itself? Or will it say, why bring anybody else into this world? There might be another pandemic. Why bother? Let's just live, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow, maybe even today we die. Uh, the unfortunate thing is the postmodern world skips that last part. They just say, eat, drink, and be merry. And they're not thinking about tomorrow we might die. Okay. Uh, here's another uh, poem that was written uh, in the same school and uh, published in the same paper but a different student called Slice. The sky inhaled the smoke, relentlessly spilling from the slice of paper rolled between his hungry fingers. They took turns, he and the sky, enjoying the silver moment and laughing past tears. I didn't understand the joke they shared as I lost myself inside a soft smile and white hair, inside the layers of my mind. Visions of him would appear, him inside the tears I didn't understand. Now that's a little bit more obvious from, without their comment, and that is they're talking about somebody smoking weed, rolling his uh, joint, and getting a great feeling from the marijuana. But he's laughing past tears. There's something that I can't bring inside me to quite understand what the joke is for them, but uh, I'm not going to criticize what they're doing because they have the right to do it. In fact, we now have a lieutenant governor who is saying everybody should be doing it recreationally, legally, as soon as we can get the laws passed. But that, again, is a good description of what life is in a postmodern world and how you express it in a postmodern poetry. Next slide. Okay, so we come to the one crucial question just before it's time to quit. Um, whatever happened to truth? Because this is where things shifted from our, a, one generation to the next in, in terms of culture. And I don't, again, not age, but the cultural generation. The one thing that has been changing and is under attack is the concept of truth. And I will most of the time uh, be using the word truth with a capital T, true truth. Now, there might be little truths uh, about certain things that, yeah, you know, th these chairs are very comfortable, that's true. Um, that might not be absolute. There might be somebody who has a back problem in which the chair is not shaped the correct way, and so for them, it's not comfortable. For me, it's comfortable. So it's my truth, but it's not their truth. Th that's the way truth is being handled. But there's also what has been historically true truth. And most of you have a copy of it. You believe that this is true and truly true and remains true. But <laughs> this book is old. This book, I mean, it's outdated. This book has mumbo jumbo religious ideas about moral values and human distinctions and is it still true? Do you hold it still as truth? And if you do, what are you saying about the people that don't believe it's true? How are you making them feel? Do you realize that if you say this is true truth and what contradicts it is false, your language is becoming violent. And violence can be spoken. Just ask Black Lives Matter. So, Lucy used to sell psychiatric aid for five cents, and here uh, Charlie Brown's hoping to get the answer. 
in pre-modern times, we, uh, what, what time do we need to cut off here? Okay. Okay. Okay, we're hitting the warning. Um, I have, uh, I'll give you a handout uh, at the end here, uh, which will summarize some of this and, uh, and flesh it out a little bit. But there are three periods of truth history. What we call the pre-modern, and that would be from ancient times up to basically the time of the Reformation. Truth, how do we know what's true? Because it was revealed to us by the person who created the universe. He designed this universe. He can tell us about it. He knows something about it that we don't know because we weren't there to watch it or to learn it. So uh, truth is known by revelation from a creator who determines all truth. We can know that truth because God created us with the capacity of a mind to reason. And through that reasoning mind, we can read or we can hear words that God has given down through history by prophets in giving the law, in speaking to us through coming to earth as God the Son, as Jesus Christ, and speaking and, and teaching and the apostles and so on. That we learn from them this information and we think about it with a mind that has the capacity to hear, read, take it in, and discover what is real. And we can check it. And so if it says that the, the, the Euphrates River was a certain place, we can go and see if the Euphrates River is in Babylon. Does it really go through where old Babylon was? Sure enough, it does. So that we can use our reasoning, check it out, find out what is real. Truth in the pre-modern is objective. It's out here. It's not a feeling. It's not a, an indigestion. It's not a, a dream that you had uh, and you try to figure out what all that meant. It, there's truth that can be checked. It can be fact-checked by people who believe in truth. If you fact-check by people who don't think truth exists, you have a different problem. So truth is to be received, to be believed, and to be acted upon. That's the way it was, at least till through the Reformation. And it was this way in the Greek world, in the Roman world. It was this way in the, the Jewish Hebrew world. It was this way in the New Testament uh, period and, and the early church. And they drew wrong conclusions sometimes about what was happening in the communion service or, or what did God really mean when he said this and do these laws apply here. We can argue but we're arguing on the basis and the facts. Then we got to the place called the Enlightenment, where we finally caught on and got more light than those old people and ancient people. And so we, we still want to know the truth. In fact, in the modern world, truth is what drives us to education, to invention, to development of to whether it's agricultural improvement or changing governments. Uh, we, we want to know what's true, what's real. That's the driving force. But in the modern period of the, post, uh, of the Enlightenment, after the, from the 1700s, about 1789 to 1989, when the time of the Berlin Wall falling, those 200 years, that truth was designed to lead us in advancing, in progress. We can sol uh, find solutions through science, through education, through experience, through expertise. Uh, we learned how to fly, get a heavier-than-air machine off the ground, uh, and we, we learned all these things because we were looking at reality. The only problem was we were saying you can find it whether you have God or not, 
whether there's a creator or not. Your mind, your reason is strong enough to make these discoveries. And so ungodly people, unbelieving people, atheistic people can do the same experiments and come to the same conclusions with mechanics or chemistry or whatever. And, but, but the modern ear, this is... We're, we're, we're going to change the world. We're going to get rid of all diseases. We're going to control all epidemics. We're, we have the technology. That's the modern world. But by the late 1890s, early 1900s, there were people who were saying, that world of science and, te and technology is letting us down. It, look what it's doing. It's putting a few people in power, and the rest of us are being oppressed. It's uh, the capitalists are running the world and the laborer, the, the, the working man, he, he's simply a serf. He's almost like a slave. And so you have the development of Marxism trying to counteract uh, the conclusions of this modern era. And you have a guy, a German by the name of Nietzsche who is saying uh, truth is not what we should be motivated by. It should be control and power. And uh, in the modern world, it was that truth can be discovered, it can be thought, you can test it, but revelation is no longer needed. You don't have to have a God to tell you, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, we just know that it's better if you don't. Uh, we don't have to uh, have a God tell us uh, that there's an eternal life. Uh, nobody knows that. You can't test that anyway. That's just a... a, a a myth, a legend, a hope. Uh, so we don't need that. What we need to do is fix this world that we're living in and don't you dare blow up this planet with your nuclear weapons and don't, don't spoil it with your uh, climate uh, uh, machinations that, that are going to you know, raise the sea level and flood Miami Beach. Uh, w w we can reason out without a God who's in control. But um, one guy said, I put no faith in faith. He said, I only trust what's in my head. So I told him that my reliance is faith in God who thought of science. The postmodern is the power, is the driving force. Who has the power? Who's in control? And that desire for power is what drives mankind. And you need to understand that especially those of you who are now white, because your drive for power think, makes you think you're better than all other races, and therefore you are a racist by virtue of you having power. Truth in the postmodern world, that's an illusion. There is no truth with a capital T. Truth is what we construct. It's been arranged by people in power. Knowledge is learning not truth and wisdom, not learning about the God who made this universe and how do we cooperate with his universe. Uh, knowledge is simply arranging information. L all these bits and pieces, learning how to uh, put it in a way that is entertaining to you. Postmodern truth is expressed uh, not in one big story. There is a God who made us. We, there's a beginning and Christ is coming again. There's an ending and here's where we fit into the flow of history. There is no big story in postmodernism. That idea, what we often call Judeo-Christian Western civilization, that is a tool being used by the powerful to repress the weak took over the world with colonies, and we had the power, we had the science, we could control them, and we said, but, but this is God's will for his planet. And the postmodern says, you guys, you're exercising power that, uh, in, in a way that's not fair. Uh, so postmodernism learns to give the power to the small groups, not the big guys at the top. And by giving everybody's experience, everybody's story is just as valid as anybody else's. Even if it contradicts, that doesn't matter. There is no truth anyway to be consistent. Everybody has a right to their own truth, their own story, their own experience, and that becomes authoritative for you. 
even though it contradicts what somebody else experienced. That doesn't matter. And so postmodernism, which was applied to architecture and art, now it came to the literature and poetry, and you saw two examples in poetry, that you can use words in every, any which way. You don't have to have rhyme or reason. Uh, just say what you feel, and that's valid. And who should criticize it? And we'll pick up that problem of language next week. But here's a handout of um, what's happening to truth, or uh, of truth, and um, we'll let somebody uh, distribute those. Let's bow in prayer. Lord God, thank you for still being the God who is there and here, the God who made this universe and you didn't abandon it, the God who created us with value as human beings created in your image. Help us to value that which you've designed and not to let other people undo it or redesign it for their own purposes and leaving you out of the picture. Bless this church and its ministries and help us to be faithful in our generation for Jesus' sake. Amen.